In this lecture, we will review radiologic findings and discuss mitigating of the risk of secondary brain injury. The mainstay of diagnostic modality for TBI patients is brain CT without contrast. C. T. Scan findings are crucial in the management of patients with head injuries or suspected intracranial hemorrhages. The type of hemorrhage size and location significantly determine the prognosis and guide treatment decisions. All patients with a GCS of 13 or less should be scanned. Those patients having focal neurologic deficit. Signs of basal skull fractures should also have brain CT to detect any intracranial pathology. TBI patients with a history of bleeding diaphysis or anticoagulant therapy have a high tendency to develop traumatic intracranial bleeding and thus should be scanned even though their clinical status is stable. We should be selective when ordering a CT scan for mild TBI patients as it will be costly for patients and also we expose patients to radiation. The Canadian CT head rule is a widely used guideline for mild TBI patients. It is highly sensitive and specific to detect intracranial injuries in mild TBI patients. A subdural hematoma occurs usually due to venous bleeding as a result of trauma incurred on the brain. It is a crescent-shaped hematoma found between the dura and the brain. It could be acute, occurring within three days of injury to the head. Acute subdural hematoma appears as a hyperdense crescentic collection. If the bleeding occurs within three to 21 days of sustaining an injury to the head, it appears as an iso-dense collection with the same density as the brain. The hematoma collection appears as hypodense or darker than the normal brain when the hematoma collection progressively develops after 21 days. Epidural hematoma develops as a result of arterial bleeding, most frequently due to a tear of the middle meningeal artery. It is a convex-shaped hyperdense area between the skull and the dura matter. Intracerebral hemorrhage presents as hyperdense areas within the brain tissue. It can have a pressure effect on the normal brain, resulting in a significant midline shift, as depicted in the picture with arrowhead. It can also be associated with intraventricular hemorrhages, as shown in the picture with an arrow. Intraventricular hemorrhage, IVH, presents on CT scan as hyperdense blood in the ventricular system. IVH can develop as an extension of traumatic intracerebral hemorrhages. Hydrocephalus commonly occurs following intraventricular hemorrhages. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, SAH, appears as hyperdense areas in the subarachnoid space following the sulci cisterns or fissures. Primary injury is the immediate damage, while secondary injury is the result of the response to the primary injury. This classification helps with the understanding of head injuries. Here is a list of common primary injuries and a list of secondary injuries. Management strategies. For the primary injury should be focused on preventing secondary injury. Primary injuries, scalp injuries, including lacerations, abrasions, or hematomas, which are visible externally and may require suturing or other wound management. Skull fractures, these can be linear, depressed basilar or open contusions, lacerations, bruised areas or tears in the brain tissue often occurring at the site of impact. Intracranial hematomas. Accumulations of blood within the intracranial space, including subdural, epidural, and intracerebral hematomas. Diffuse axonal injury, DII. Widespread damage to nerve fibers in the brain, resulting from shearing forces during the traumatic event. Diffuse vascular injury, damage to blood vessels. <sighs> damage to blood. These include lacerations, abrasions, or hematomas within the brain, which can lead to hemorrhage.
and potentially increased intracranial pressure, ICP, cranial nerve injuries, damage to one or more of the cranial nerves resulting in specific neurological deficits. Hypoxia ischemia, reduced oxygen supply to the brain, and impaired respiratory function can exacerbate brain injury. Hypotension, low blood pressure decreases, cerebral perfusion and worsens brain injury. Edema plus herniation, swelling and increased pressure within the brain potentially leads to herniation syndromes. Raised intracranial pressure, ICP, results from swelling hemorrhage or other factors. Meningitis, abscess. Infections of the meninges or the brain can develop as a secondary complication. Seizure disorders may develop after head trauma, particularly severe injury. Electrolyte imbalance. Disturbances in electrolyte levels impact brain function. SIADH syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone affects fluid balance and can be associated with head injuries. Hypo hyperglycemia. Abnormal blood sugar levels can impact brain metabolism and function. Hydrocephalus, accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid, potentially leads to increased ICP. Cushing triad is a classic clinical finding that requires surgery. The patient's level of consciousness deteriorates, often progressing from alertness to drowsiness confusion, and eventually coma. The presence of an asymmetric or dilated pupil typically on one side, is known as anisocoria. This indicates pressure on the oculometer nerve, cranial nerve three. The affected pupil often fails to constrict in response to light leading to dilation, weakness or paralysis on one side of the body. This weakness is typically on the opposite side of the dilated pupil due to compression of motor pathways such as the corticospinal tract. Understanding the intracranial pressure volume curve helps understand neurotrauma. Compliance phase. The cranial contents exhibit compliance in the normal physiological range of intracranial volumes. The intracranial space can accommodate small increases in volume with minimal pressure changes. The curve is a flat slope during this phase, indicating good compliance. Steep phase, limited compliance, as intracranial volume increases beyond the physiological range due to brain swelling hemorrhage or mass effect. The curve enters a steep phase. The intracranial space becomes less compliant and small increases in volume result in a substantial rise in intracranial pressure. This phase is critical as intracranial compliance is compromised. Herniation phase. If intracranial pressure continues to rise beyond the critical threshold, it can lead to brain herniation where brain tissue shifts or herniates within the skull. This is a life-threatening condition associated with severe neurological impairment and is fatal if not promptly addressed. Critical threshold. The ICP volume curve eventually reaches a critical threshold called the critical volume. Further increases in volume lead to a rapid and dramatic increase in intracranial pressure. This threshold represents the limit of intracranial compensation and pressures. Management of TBI involves addressing the primary insult and mitigating the effects of secondary insults. 